Hello. Today. This is Arun Chinadurai, Associate Director for Business Development here at Agilisim Consulting. Today's webinar is on how to get the most out of your existing Amazon Redshift investments while keeping costs down. This is our first webinar in a series of webinars around the theme AWS optimization, where we intend to share the lessons learned and optimization strategies from delivering enterprise big data analytic solutions over the last seven years. We'll go through the presentation deck first and answer the questions towards the end. But please feel free to queue up your questions in the questions chat window. All assets related to this webinar, including this presentation deck and link to the recording will be shared post the webinar. I would like to quickly set the context before I introduce the speakers. Cloud data warehouses or CDW as they're commonly known as is a critical piece of today's enterprise data and analytics platforms. Redshift has been the CDW market leader for several years now. With tens of thousands of customers, Redshift has been by far the most widely adopted CDW. Redshift has always maintained an edge over its competition in terms of performance and predictable cost. As a Redshift service delivery program partner, we have seen the product team make significant investments in launching innovative features that address potential market needs at a very rapid pace. We have released over 200 new features in the last 18 months. Though Redshift offers new features, cost and performance advantages, we have noticed that some organizations are still challenged in maintaining the initial enthusiasm while they migrated to Redshift first. Let us see why. The architects play a key role in designing today's enterprise solutions on the cloud. This architect community, due to their daily grind, are left with limited time and bandwidth, which has limited their ability to keep up with rapid pace of innovation, the time to experiment and learn new features, and extend their knowledge on the latest best practices. All of this have impeded organizations' ability to extract the maximum value from their existing Redshift investments. What we would like to do in the next 30 to 35 minutes is to share the knowledge that we have gained over the last seven years. This is aligned to the best practices and latest features of Amazon Redshift as of today. We would like to start off with the key design principles, architectural considerations of Amazon Redshift. Then we would like to share top optimization strategies for Amazon Redshift cost and performance. Followed by a success story where we helped a client reduce their Redshift run cost by 40%. And then conclude how we can help you optimize your Redshift workloads. Before we move on, I would like to do a quick introduction about Agilisium and our Redshift expertise. We are a big data and analytics services firm with a clear focus to help organizations take their data to inside sleep. We are over 330 cloud and big data analytics experts spread across strategic locations globally. As an AWS advanced consulting partner, our focus has always been around data and analytics. The data and analytics competency is the first one we achieved from AWS. This was followed by service delivery programs around Redshift, EMR, and QuickSight. We, are, we were one of the first AWS consulting partners to achieve the Amazon Redshift service delivery program partner status. We recently achieved the DevOps competency as well primarily due to the DevOps work that we have delivered as part of our enterprise data and analytics projects. We are an AWS 50 certified organization and we, and we plan to double that number in the next 12 months. Over the years, we noticed that our enterprise clients are, le are leveraging third-party technology partners like Databricks and Snap projects, whose products work seamlessly with the AWS ecosystem. We have tremendous know-how and deep expertise in delivering big data 
data analytics solutions, leveraging both AWS, Databricks, and Snaplogic. Uh, this is a list of our data and analytics customers, um, many of whom we have delivered enterprise big data solutions using Redshift. If you are wondering what is the industry focus of Achilesium, it is media and entertainment and healthcare and life sciences. Achilesium is a top three Amazon Redshift competency partner in the US with a laser focus on AWS data and analytics solutions. We have migrated over 15 petabytes of data to AWS through successful big data and analytics projects. This was made possible through a large pool of scarce talent. We have over 55 AWS certified experts and many of these solution architects are regular attendees of AWS area of depth training by Amazon Redshift product team. With that said, I would like to introduce the speakers. I'm very pleased to co-present this webinar along with our CTO and head of Achillesium Innovation Labs, Jay Palniyappan, and Smita Basavaraju, who is a key big data architect again from Achillesium Innovation Labs. I would like now to invite Jay to present the key design principles on AWS. Over to you, Jay. Thank you, Aaron. Um, hello, folks. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I'm just going to talk about briefly talk about like you know the key uh, considerations uh, that we focus on while designing uh, a Redshift ecosystem. Maybe a new system, or we are reviewing it um, for optimizations and other other op other opportunities. Okay. Um, so uh, there are there are five key uh, design principles that uh, AWS has. Uh, laid out as part of um, what what they call it as a well architected framework, right? So um, and we we uh, we take this these five principles and uh, built our own sort of uh, review framework on top of that, right? So uh, and and we are calling it as the well architected review um, for for Redshift, uh, like another moniker um, for our Red Redshift optimization program. So um, in this in this uh, review, we focus on uh, cost optimization, performance efficiency, security, reliability, and operational excellence. I'm just going to go over this like in a brief view about what these are. Um, so cost optimization is uh, the idea of like you know understanding uh, like you know how much uh, of capacity, uh, cloud capacity, or redshift capacity that uh, you would need or you're consuming, right? Um, and based on based on that need or understanding, to right size your cluster. Um, you know that that may include uh, having different pricing strategies, like you know by reserve capacity, or like you know choosing the right node types, or um, you know, increasing the node type or decreasing the node type, and, and so forth. Again, the idea is to do this without compromising business SLAs, uh, and this is an important step. In order to make sure that, like you know, the, the, your redshift ecosystem is well rounded and cost efficient. And the second is perform, performance efficiency. It kind of goes one level deeper, right? Uh, so in in this uh, in this uh, sort of a pillar or a review a review focus, we take a look at all your workloads um, that you guys are running. It may be ETL workloads or reporting workloads, uh, and try to understand how efficiently they are running. All right, how efficiently they are using your cluster, um, that and that may lead to more optimizations on the data side. Where like you know, we will try to make sure that like that your data is distributed right, your workload is dis distributed right, um, your clusters compute memory uh, capacity is utilized properly, um, and your disk is utilized properly, and so forth, right? Um, and that will kind of like unearth opportunities to for, for us to improve efficiency and like again this may also lead to change in node types um, you know and other opportunities for us to optimize in terms of um, un, unutilized period can be uh, can be fast and resumed or elastically scaled and so forth right so though all those will be unearthed as part of the performance efficiency review um, 
And security, security is all about like you know, protecting your data and your infrastructure, right? So here, uh, our focus is uh, making sure that uh, your network security design, uh, your data security design is, is well thought through uh, based on your uh, policy and compliance needs. Um, and and also to ensure that like you know um, your your network uh, related um, needs or or requirements uh, by your infosec team or maybe your even your internal needs are properly met. Um, and reliability pillar uh, reliability is all about business continuity, right? So ensuring that your redshift cluster and your ecosystem is resilient towards disruptions. Uh, through maybe internal or external, um, or like you know, disruptions, so that that your your, your ecosystem is uh, resilient. So um, usually here, the the focus area is going to be whether like your solution is highly available if the need if there is need for that, or you know if you need a a good a disaster recovery uh, plan and backup plan as those uh, those. Uh, Requirements are being met properly through your design, right? so that's that's the that, review there. Operational excellence is all about uh, ensuring that uh, the continuous monitoring and management of your uh, Redshift ecosystem is uh, taken care uh, in a in a more modern and automated fashion through like you know DevOps processes, through CI/CD processes, and so forth. So you know, we'll try to get an understanding of how you're doing that and provide recommendations there. So uh, these are the five areas we primarily focus on uh, reviewing. Um, so even though there are, there are five areas um, here, today we are gonna focus only on two areas um, due to time constraints. Um, Smitha, who's our big data architect, will dive deep into these topics. Go ahead, Smitha. Thank you, Jay. Optimization is a continuous process. For instance, Today, we might optimize the cluster for the performance and cost, but over a period, there could be many factors that could totally disturb this arrangement, including increase in the data volume, change in the business demand, or the technology itself may evolve. Either ways, we may have to regularly revisit our strategies to get optimized results. I'm sure we all agree to that. Cost optimization is effective only if there is no compromise on performance. Well, now let's look at some of the optimization strategies in terms of complexity or the effort involved versus the impact of performance. While some of these are easy and straightforward, others require significant planning and may involve architecture changes as well. In this graph, we have listed seven strategies based on our experience in working with some of the clients that Arun spoke about earlier in the presentation. Let's start with the easier ones, what could be also called as low-hanging fruits, reserved instances. Most of us here know that AWS allows us to purchase reserved nodes by choosing the duration of commitment between one or three years. And we also have an option of choosing the cost mode, which can be no upfront, partial upfront, or all upfront. The underlying AWS cost principle here simply is the more you reserve, and the more you pay upfront, higher is the discounts, which means maximum discounts are obtained when choosing a three-year reserved instances with all upfront payment, which could be up to 70% when compared to on-demand instances. While this is true for enterprises, medium scale of startups who are on the growth path can start off with on-demand and depending on the duration and demand, they can take a call on RIs. Also, Reserved instances are best when used for always on instances. To highlight what this actually means, for example, one of our clients was spending around 110K on on-demand DS to 8X large with two node instances for the past eight months. We simply saved 25% of their cost by moving to reserved instances with one year of commitment and no up upfront charges. It's that simple. The next one is the pause and resume option. This is another simple and yet an effective approach. Consider this situation. 
one of our clients was using on demand dc to large 24 bar 7 as part of their development instance we found that the cpu utilization dropped to 10% during the non business hours weekends or holidays as opposed to 60% during business hours just by enabling the pause and resume option help them save cost by 50% so what's actually happening here is that when on demand instances are paused only storage charges are applicable organization using on demand instances only will stand to gain most by using this option the next set of features we are going to talk about impact the performance of the system and thereby have impact on the cost savings The first one here is elastic resize. Organizations prefer data warehouse that is faster to scale and do not want to compromise between performance and concurrency. And elastic resize is the option that allows us to scale up or down of clusters in minutes. For example, when we faced a need in our enough our clients to handle sudden surge of data in the scale of terabytes, we simply use the elastic resize option. the nodes were scaled up instantly to increase compute and storage without having to plan for capacity in advance if the organizations are currently planned for peak capacity of clusters then by just enabling the elastic resize option they can obtain a significant cost savings to order of 15% what we need to keep in mind while using this options are scaling more than double the number of existing nodes is not an option using elastic resize we need to use classic resize scaling down of instances to previous size of clusters or less than half the number of clusters may or may not be possible depending on our storage requirement another interesting feature that impacts redshift performance is concurrency scaling which is enabled at wlm queue level concurrency scaling feature automatically spins up transient clusters serves the request in the queue and automatically scales down the clusters what we need to know here is concurrency scaling is used for reporting purpose alone and for every 24 hours of cluster in use one hour of free concurrency scaling is added and this can be accumulated and used during predictable workloads if this exceeds the accumulated hours then it's billed per second for the cost of cluster price One of the most welcome change in 2019 has been the introduction of RA3 instances. RA3 instances allows us to scale compute and storage independently, which means the pricing is also loosely coupled with compute and storage. In terms of benefit, we have seen 200% improvement in performance during the benchmarking exercises which we recently conducted between RA3 versus DS2X large. since ra3 nodes are based on large capacity of cache with high performance ssd backed by s3 it's going to validate your instances to see it's good to validate your instances to see if ra3 can be better fit for your storage and compute needs the next one is right sizing currently redshift provides three flavor of instances dense compute which is ideal for high reporting and minimal storage demands dense storage is used for i storage and ra3 instance choosing optimal size of production instances helps in lowering the cost between 15 to 20% it is always good to start sizing based on the workloads depending on cpu io disk and network requirements the last optimization strategy is the complex of the lot because it impacts the current design and architecture of the system most common issues that the organizations face today is that of long running queries unable to achieve parallelism the underlying factors that cause this are data skew across the nodes high amount of io and data not being compressed optimally in order to resolve this we need to look at the key strategies to improve the performance in paying attention towards distribution key sort key and encoding aspects use proper distribution key which helps to minimize data movement across nodes auto distribution is good for tables less than 5 million rows for optimal performance choose the columns used in the joins or filters as sort keys we need to be cautious in using interleaved sort keys because it's going to add more overhead 
new encoding type AC64 has been included and using AC64, we see close to 30% storage benefits and up to 50% increase in the performance when compared to LZO and ZSTD. Along with all these practices, we can also look at the benefits of Redshift materialized views to improve the performance of long running queries. Lastly, Redshift is moving towards auto management. Ensure that auto analyze, auto sort, and auto vacuum are enabled. If you are using interleaved sort keys, we need to run vacuum re index manually. Redshift has also introduced auto WLM. Using this option, Redshift manages memory and CPU utilization based on usage patterns. Some of the best practices for manual WLM are do not create more than four queues, use TMR to monitor performance from bad queries, do not have to have more than 15 concurrent users, and it's good to leave at least 5% of memory unallocated. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Over to you, Jay. Uh, thank you, Smitha. Hope uh, those those um, like you know pointers are helpful for you guys to um, to kind of take a, go back and take a look at your Redshift ecosystem and have a better understanding of how you can optimize uh, your existing um, clusters. So uh, meanwhile, like I'm just going to share a, a, a recent um, review we did for one of our customers. Um, through through our our set of tools and and processes um, and so this you know uh, which may be helpful for for uh, you guys to just kind of get an idea of like you know what we do and what's the benefit out of this this review right so uh, this customer has a, a 25 terabyte Redshift workload running on ds 2 uh, they've been running this for the last eight months um, so I mean uh, the uh, the <clears throat> The workloads are finally stabilized. It's up and running. Um, so they have just came back and you know asked us to take a look at it and to holistically uh, provide a review across these these five pillars, right? Um, so uh, when we when we when we took a look at their uh, uh, their cluster and did the assessment through our tools, uh, we found like you know um, you know optimization opportunities across. Um, Know, all these pillars, right? Um, so let, let's start with the bigger ones. So for uh, for cost optimization, uh, we found that like you know they are they were still running on on demand nodes, um, and uh, the the reason that they, they provided us is like you know year on year they're doubling their data, and they were not sure about like you know committing to something for for uh, a year, right? Uh, because they may, they may they may think that like you know they may double the size or resize into something else and all and so forth, um, and um, so that's fair enough, right? So, but even then, like if you think about it, even if they started with five nodes and like you know they paid for the reserve for the five nodes, they would have sought say twenty five percent for that five nodes. But again, then there are other reasons within an enterprise why they may not go for for um, reserve nodes. But the idea is that like we were kind of like able to like articulate that and. You know, uh, yeah, send it back to them. Um, the the other option again, uh, due to the recent release of uh, RA three, is that like we were able to like you know take a look at that from that perspective because their their uh, need was growing from a storage capacity perspective, but their compute capacity was not that not that much, right? Um, and because they were always looking at last quarter or last year and so forth, and the historical data was not used that much. Uh, so we, we kind of like you know, again now recommended, let's say, with RA3 separated uh, compute and storage uh, capabilities, like you know, and it's like that's not a bad, a bad idea to take a look at, uh, take a look, because your compute needs are like around 30, 30 percent. So moving towards RA3 with better internals and separated uh, storage and compute, you could able to independently scale your storage without, um, you know, scaling your your compute. Um, and that's that is something that, that they're really appreciative of the feedback and, and the um, in, like in the knowledge that we kind of like, share with them. Uh, and the other findings um, were around operational excellence, right? Uh, so it seemed it seemed obvious, but like you know, there are a few logs that they were not enabled, um, and they were not actually even using CloudWatch alerts uh, for some reason, or 
you know, properly set up. So we were able to like, you know, point those things out. Um, and from a uh, security perspective, uh, they were running on, um, you know, public subnets, even though there's, there's no need for them to, uh, like, you know, expose the cluster to two external customers or anything like that. Uh, they were running on public subnets. So there the recommendation is to like move to private subnets. And they were storing sensitive data, like you know, um, where it is like critical to their their business. So, uh, however, they were not encrypting their data uh, at uh, at rest or transit. So we were we recommended that. So uh, again, as, as you can see, like you know, across these five pillars, we were able to like find some critical, uh, like you know, uh, recommendations that's just invaluable for them uh, as part of this review. So from a cost perspective, again. Um, the, there is an opportunity for them to like you know reduce the cost by seventy percent by using RA threes and like you know uh, using cost and resin on the uh, non production clusters um, and with the with RA three again like you know they, they stand to gain like you know a faster query performance because of the of the internals of the of RA three as well so um, that's that's an example of a of a review that we did recently and. And finding so it just kind of gives you a sort of a gauge as to like what you can expect out of a, out of a review like this. Um, so hopefully this was this was helpful for you guys. Uh, thank you. Uh, now over to you. Thank you, Jay. Um, so um, it was a very nice elicitation on the best practices, the optimization strategies, and from the success story, you might have uh, wondered like you know how do we put this into a process like it. It's not a simple one-step process. So uh, over the years, we have come up with a three-step process. Uh, so the way we do is uh, we will do uh, a diagnose first, followed by an optimize, and then a maintain. A diagnose is the shortest. It typically takes um, a three-day time frame where we'll do a quick fact-based assessment of your wretched workload based on AWS well-architected framework pillars. And the output of that is a finding and recommendations report and a remediation plan. And the remediation plan is a precursor for the next phase, which is the optimize. So top observations from the finding and rec recommendations report will be part of the remediation plan, which will be the candidates for optimization, either along cost or performance or any other pillar based on the use case. And the optimize phase typically takes anywhere uh, upwards of two weeks uh, depends on the criticality and um, the uh, business need how far uh, how fast and what's the number of things that uh, you would want us uh, to do deliver and as uh, Smith I mentioned earlier you know this is um, optimization is not in one and then exercise uh, we'll have to constantly maintain this so that's where we want to kind of come and do a quarterly if not in half yearly health check uh, audit of your system of your redshift system to see like uh, where it is uh, with respect to uh, performance cost and all those five pillars and also extend your knowledge on the new features and best practices so that's how we kind of split this entire um, optimization exercise for redshift uh, we start off with a three day simple um, uh, yet comprehensive redshift assessment followed by an optimize uh, optimization exercise and then a regular maintenance of your wretched workload. Uh, now I'll quickly run through like how this diagnose uh, is done. Uh, so we deliver this fact-based assessment uh, using our proprietary automated assessment toolkit called Redshift Inspector. Uh, so this is actually founded on our Redshift best practices collected and updated over the last seven years. Uh, there are over 100 best practices and we have identified this based on migrating 15 plus petabytes over to the cloud. And out of this 100 plus best practices, we have arrived at 60 point check, which will be covering across the five pillars and do a comprehensive assessment of your workload in an automated fashion. Uh, to put it, uh, to give an idea of how big or enormous the process, if done manually, is this could could have easily taken anywhere in terms of uh, several weeks to several months, depending on um, how how wide 
your knowledge in best practices and uh, how fast we can automate. So this was built over the last three, four years, and that's where we are able to deliver such a comprehensive assessment in a span of three days using an automated toolkit. Okay, so what goes into this toolkit, right? Uh, so this toolkit is essentially um, a set of diagnostic queries uh, that we would run on your existing Redshift workload. So the Redshift workload, the candidate Redshift workload has to be identified by you. So the, in terms of customer contribution, we would need you to identify a candidate Redshift workload. Make your business and technical SMEs uh, available for a workshop. So in addition to this diagnostic queries that we run on top of your workload, we would also want to understand the design and architectural considerations and um, more light on your business use case. So what actually made you decide uh, on these design and architecture um, uh, for Redshift? So all of that would come through those half day workshop. That combined with the diagnostic query result would help us in deriving the finding and recommendation reports. So if you look at the right side, the deliverables is a finding and recommendation report where we will be able to give you accurate observations by criticality across all the five pillars. So like the way Jay was mentioning on the success stories, we'll be able to identify those areas of uh, improvement and we would also mark them the number of observations or number of areas of improvement and also give a criticality rating. Whether it's critical, meaning you have to fix that in the next one week or so, uh, needs improvement, or something that can wait for 30 days. Well, architect is something you've done a great job, you know, keep it up. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, an actionable remediation plan would follow and finding and recommendations report. And this would be based on some of the top observations from the finding and recommendation report. Should you choose to implement the remediation plan internally, great. Uh, however, would you would like to should you choose to uh, involve Agilisium to help accelerate, we would be glad to help you out as well. Moving on, uh, I just want to give a quick view of like, you know, the kind of key facets that the Agilisium Redshift Inspector covers. I'm not going to delve into the detail, but this is to kind of give you an idea, the kind of factors or facets that we cover under each of these pillars of the AWS Well Architecture Framework. These are facets that are very unique to a Redshift workload. And these have been curated over the last three, four years uh, and have been updated regularly. And uh, moving on, uh, this is the sample report. This is how the report looks like. Um, this is an earlier version of our uh, uh, report template of Redshift Inspector. Uh, you would have um, 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 X and Y axis where the health of your workload across each pillars will be plotted the one that uh, smitha uh, started her discussion her uh, as a uh, discussion with and uh, we would have detailed each of these pillars along with observations recommendations and what would be, what would be the benefit should you implement those recommendations along with pointers to learn more about this recommendation these could be aws blogs technical articles or some of uh, agilism's talks here moving on i thought i'll uh, show you uh, a glimpse of what that uh, cost or uh, performance or for that matter a pillar based uh, report would look like. Uh, this is a sample report from one of the um, recent assessment that we did where um, there was observations across all five pillars. Uh, I'm just showing you the cost and performance here. Uh, so there's obvious um, Observations on you know uh, the RAs that they could have used, and uh, they could have. Uh, there is a room for actually migrating uh, to an RA3 uh, for better performance and reducing cost, and also uh, a room for a data placement strategy so that uh, all those cold data can be moved to S3 uh, and leveraging Spectrum to run a federated query on top of that. Likewise, uh, performance there was again room. For, uh, there was a lot of room. Um, so uh, some of those uh, table design considerations or uh, strategies that Smita was running through was also found based on which uh, we were able to tell them, hey, there's a better way of designing your table for performance, uh, not just downstream, but also your data ingestion would be much faster if you're going to use a time series data model rather than one monolithic table. Like this, there was more on uh, the concurrency scaling because there was a lot of uh, users downstream reporting analytics users. And uh, there was also some observations on 
uh, columns with large width, uh, which will lead to data being spilling, data being spilled to the disk, which will have a performance impact. So all of that were identified and the recommendations were given and um, uh, along with the action items. Uh, with that, uh, uh, we have pretty much come uh, to the end of the webinar. Um, as, um, uh, you know, as part of this webinar, uh, we are glad to announce that um, the webinar participants um, get to have this three-day well-architected Redshift assessment offered at $0. Uh, so if you want to learn more about it or just curious what goes into it, a learn a bit more about it, uh, please feel free to drop a note to sales at hdcm.com and we'd be happy to explain you more and uh, see how we can take it forward and uh, uh, help optimize your Redshift workload. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I'll, uh, uh, you know, we'll come to the end of the session. I'll open the floor for Q&A. Awesome. Um, let me look at the questions if there is any uh, common ones and um, address them first before moving on to the next. Um, okay, here's the first question. Um, what happens to the cache if the cluster is paused? Jay Smitha, would you like to have a go at it? Yeah, yeah, uh, this is a good answer. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, whenever there is a, a cluster which is paused, we see that the resources are also released. So we believe that there is no way that the cache can be maintained. Awesome. Um, here's another one. When do we use elastic resize uh, versus concurrent scaling? Okay. Uh, elastic resize is used for your predictable workloads like month end process or weekend process uh, and you, you where you need high compute and high storage but you can also have situations like where you want to change the cluster type and uh, also you might you might get into a situation where you are actually running an etl workload and also have to balance the number of uh, peak users in those scenarios uh, elastic resize might help will help uh, when when it comes to handling only the reporting request, uh, concurrency scaling is the one which we need to choose. Perfect. Um, the next one is, uh, can we move from DS to X large reserved instance to RE3? Uh, so, okay, let me, let me try to take the question. So uh, reserve capacity uh, has, uh, like is not tied to an instance, right? It's not tied to a cluster instance. This is just that, um, it's a sort of a, um, a discount that you're purchasing, right? A discount coupon that you're purchasing, if I have to put it that way. So um, if you have to uh, move from one cluster type to the other, I don't think there is an uh, implicit conversion of the capacity, reserve capacity. Um, so I think uh, for 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 our some of our customers have already seen these scenarios. The usual way to deal with those those uh, Scenarios is work with your uh, AWS account manager. Um, he can help you out how uh, ways how to uh, transfer your your result uh, like the purchases from one instance class or a cluster class to another cluster class. Awesome. Um, the next one is how is the RA3 performance when compared to DS2? Does your benchmarking exercise address that? Uh, yes, we have done the benchmarking internally and we see uh, close to 150 to 200 percent improvement in the performance. Awesome. Uh, Jay, would you like to add uh, to that? I mean, to that question or should I move on to the next? Um, yeah, so again, um, I think the, the Smitha provided the distal answer, which is like we did a RA3 benchmarking recently compared to DS, DS2s. Uh, for the same sort of like you know uh, price point, uh, RA3 provides double the uh, like you know performance plus um, you know a ton of additional storage because again like in you know, a storage and compute is uh, sort of like you know uh, decoupled here, right? Um, so yeah, uh, RA3 is a good choice like you know if you have a large volume of data and you're running on DS2, it's definitely a candidate for you guys to validate. Perfect. Uh, the next one, I think I'll probably take this one. 
Uh, are these three service offerings, diagnose, optimize, and maintain? Uh, if so, can you tell us about the cost of the offering or package? Um, the diagnose is pretty much offered uh, at a flat rate. That's typically how we do it. And uh, it's a three-day quick uh, assessment, uh, yet comprehensive one. Uh, so for today's webinar registrants, as we mentioned earlier, it is being offered free of cost. However, the optimize, uh, optimization for either performance, cost, uh, it, it depends completely based on the observations that we uh, identify from the findings and recommendation report. Uh, so the pricing options have been uh, compelling. We do have an outcome-based pricing, or uh, we might even do a gain share pricing model. Uh, but it totally depends on the uh, observations, the complexity, uh, and uh, the scope um, from the uh, observations that we have made uh, in the finding and recommendation. And in terms of maintain, again, it's uh, sort of a um, fixed fee that we do, uh, and it kind of varies by uh, by use case by use case. And uh, again, that's something that um, uh, we do uh, kind of try to templatize uh, for every client so that we know like what are the key metrics uh, that we use to monitor for their wretched workload uh, on a quarterly or half yearly basis. Uh, hope that answers. Um, moving on, um, how is your toolkit uh, different from Redshift Advisor? I, I think they're referring to the Redshift Inspector versus Redshift Advisor. Jay Smitha, would you like to have a go at it? Yep, um, so the, the Redshift Advisor uh, is Primarily focuses on the, the the performance stats of the cluster, right? So it's it's it uh, it is a it is a it is uh, as part of a review that we take a look at that uh, advice or recommendations as well. But that purely focuses on the performance aspect of of the cluster. So ours covers uh, the rest of the pillars as well. We talked about cost optimization, uh, security, and other things. And I'm sure, like in our distributed advice, it will have more and more features, and we will rely more on those as we go along. Um, and so, but uh, it's right now it's complementary. So we take that and we add more uh, to, to that. Perfect. Um, the next one is, will my data warehouse cluster be available during scaling? Uh, that's a good question. It depends if the concurrency scaling is enabled, the cluster will be available throughout. Uh, if it's in the case of elastic resize, cluster will be unavailable anywhere between like uh, 2 to 15 minutes, depending on your cluster size. The next one is currently we are using DC1 clusters and can we use elastic resize option? From what we know, DC1 clusters might not allow us to use elastic resize. Uh, however, Redshift allows us to migrate from DC1 to DC2. Uh, having moved to DC2, they should be able to use resize. Uh, the next one is um, Redshift data is stored in single AZ. How to handle high availability and uh, DR, disaster recovery? So, yes, that is true. Uh, um, so, uh, again, Redshift at any given point in time runs on one AZ. Um, there is automatic failover, I think, like, you know, due to whatever disruptions in AZ goes down. Think that there is an opportunity to come back in, in another AZ, but um, it is not highly available. Meaning there is there is a downtime. If you want true highly available systems, then um, there are opportunities to create, run multiple Redshift clusters and multiple AZs and put a load balancer in front of it and like you know uh, manage manage it that way. So uh, we have seen customers doing that, um, you know, to to increase availability. And in terms of um, uh, DR. Uh, so out of the box, Redshift provides like uh, automated uh, backups or snapshots, right? So every eight hours or every five GB of data, I think. Um, so it automatically backs it up. So it's the uh, the backup is available for you. Um, however, it's you know another sort of um, caveat with that is for for accidental delete clusters. Let's like say if somebody your admin invariably went in an accident, you deleted a cluster, the automatic snapshots kind of delete, gets deleted along with it, right? Um, so what you can do there is uh, you can do manual snapshot, which kind of lives outside of the life cycle of, of your cluster. And even better, um, if you want, if you have DR requirements that like, you know, for another region, you can do cross region copy of the of your snapshots and, you know, um, have a, a automated process. Like we talked about operational excellence, right? So you, you should actually have automated all of this so that 
in case you need to bring this up, you can go into another region, run your cloud formation template uh, with the backup that's there. It should be up and running in a matter of um, minutes. So um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that is the general sort of like, you know, um, DR strategy we see a lot of our customers doing. And then obviously for HA, yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Jay. Uh, we are good on time. We'll probably take one more question. Um, uh, if I need to migrate from legacy data warehouse to Redshift, uh, how to evaluate the initial cluster size for optimum performance as the Redshift inspector is primarily focused on existing RS cluster? Um, so when you're, here's the, here's the thing, right? So um, from a storage perspective, the, the math is like, you know, two to two is to three or three is to, uh, sort of one is to three or two is to three, meaning in terms of compression. Let's say if you have raw data sizes, um, 10 terabytes, then you will plan the capacity for like, you know, five terabytes in Redshift because, um, you know, uh, Redshift does a really, really good job of compressing your data and storing it. Uh, that's from a storage perspective, but compute is sort of uh, another another beast in itself. Uh, one of the great points about again um, Redshift or any cloud-based ecosystem is that like you don't have to right size on day one, right? So uh, you bring the workload in, you right size based on running your performance tests and other other requirements, storage and compute requirements. Once you have a decent enough understanding of how, how you know what size is right for you, both from ETL perspective and your reporting perspective, um, you can um, resize, do elastic resize or uh, like, you know, kind of use concurrent scaling to figure out what method works best, right? And then once once that workload stabilizes, then you can go for RI. Right. Um, that's that's the beauty of, uh, beauty of cloud where you can elastically scale as you need. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about right, right sizing or uh, sizing for your peak uh, workload. So, um, Awesome. Uh, just to, yeah, just to add on to that, I mean, Redshift Inspector is primarily targeted at uh, optimizing existing uh, Redshift workload. Uh, so, <clears throat> for um, assessing and uh, and legacy data warehouse to uh, see what would be the right size uh, Redshift cluster, there are a set of different tools uh, in the AWS ecosystem as well as some custom tools from within HPC. Um. I think with that, I think uh, we have come, uh, we have addressed all the questions that have been raised. Um, and uh, we would like to thank you all uh, for taking the time to come and listen to us. Um, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is an a webinar series. We will share the invites for the next, next webinar. Uh, hopefully you join in that as well. Um, thank you all again for joining. Uh, you have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.